You're listening to the Garbage Pod. Go from eight and start. Eight, seven, six, four, three, two, zero, and lift off. Hello everybody, welcome to the Garbage Pod for the 3rd of December 2012. Well, it's been uh, quite an exciting time in the Garden City. Uh, if anyone's been following my tweets or um, my updates on Facebook, um, you will know about this already. But um, a Hollywood movie has been filmed over the last few months in Letchworth. Um, yes, indeed. It's uh, a film called The World's End, um, starring Simon Pegg, and written by Simon Pegg and Nick Frost and uh, Martin Freeman as well um, and it's all set around um, weird goings on during a pub crawl which is quite ironic really because um, Letchworth in its day was a dry town yes it was a um, a Quaker town until uh, about 1961 um, and yeah, you couldn't buy alcohol in the town centre. Uh, yet they decided to <laughs> set the film in Letchworth, or an imaginary town. But um, yeah, uh, the film actually comes out in uh, August next year, 2013. And um, yeah, I'll be definitely going to see it just to see if I can recognise any of the locations because um, a lot of the properties had their signs changed um, so none of the pubs actually uh, are the original names of the pubs, they're all fictional um, pubs including the uh, World's End itself which is actually known locally as the Gardener's Arms um, the reason why I mention this is that um, on Saturday the 1st of December Letchworth um, had their um, Christmas lights switched on. Um, it's a little bit late. Usually it's around uh, about the last week in November, but um, because of the filming, um, they couldn't put the Christmas lights up because um, it was supposed to be set around the August-September time of year. Um, but um, obviously you don't have Christmas lights up then. <laughs> so... Uh, that had to be put back till the 1st of December and um, as a surprise to the people attending the light switch on ceremony uh, Nick Frost and um, Simon Pegg turned up for the proceedings and um, here's a little piece uh, of a recording uh, from uh, that ceremony um, excuse the raw uh, and, and very bad recording it was actually done on a mobile phone so it's it's not a brilliant recording but bear with it it's uh, quite entertaining Letchworth, we really appreciate it. Thank you. If you think the traffic is bad now, wait until there are thousands of tourists coming through here in buses. By that time, we'll be long gone and you won't be able to touch us. Exactly. So there you go. That was Simon Pegg and Nick Frost at the uh, Letchworth Christmas light switch on last Saturday. 
the rest of this show, as you can probably tell by the beginning segment there, is going to be space related. And the reason for this is that John and I made the last Garbage Pod episode and we did include originally a section all about space related issues and it didn't actually go with the flow of the last show. It was about 20 odd minutes worth of recording time. I didn't want to waste it because there were some really interesting topics brought up in that segment. So I thought, ah, I could make another Garbage Pod episode out of this. So uh, join John and I as we boldly go into space. Space ministers are set to decide whether whether to develop a German-led robotic lunar lander. A mission could be launched in 2018 at a cost of $650 million. They're going to propose it to their member states at the ministerial council meeting in... uh, I don't know how to pronounce this. I think it's Caserta in Italy. Scheduled for launch in 2018 on the uh, ESA or ESA owned Soyuz rocket from the European spaceport in French Guiana, uh, the lunar lander would land using a rocket assisted touchdown near the moon's south pole sometime in 2019 for a six month surface mission. Have you heard about that one? No, don't know about that. ESA signed an $8.4 million contract with Astrium in September 2010 to design the lander and present a cost estimate for the mission. The Astrium study confirmed that the total cost of the lunar lander would be $650 million with uh, the development, construction, testing, launch and operations of the spacecraft taking between... Uh, 390 million and 454 million of that budget. It'll be the first time that um, Europe have actually done any research on the moon surface, so uh, that'd be quite good if they can actually pull this off. Is there anything more to learn, though, from the moon? There's lots to learn from the moon. What they want to know, basically, is if it is definitely sustainable for, for things like water. Uh, that's what they need to know, because if they if they do decide at some point to make a lunar base they're going to need water not only for drinking but they're going to need water to produce oxygen but on the reverse side of that i was reading my latest issue of all about space magazine Mm -hmm. (laughs) and um a bit of a plug there um (laughs) nasa plans to build a space station a thousand times farther into space than the iss what they're planning to do is build an orbital outpost orbiting around the far side of the moon interesting and this is from a leaked document from nasa to the white house so what sort of things would they be doing there that's not done at iss or would this be like a, a continuation of iss well basically iss is due to retire sometime after 2020 yeah and what they plan to do is use some of the components from iss to build this new one some reports suggest they would enlist the help of russia italy and possibly some others to do it mm-hmm. mainly because they're the countries that pour in more money than any of the others in in uh, in europe basically what they want to use it for is a refueling point and stopping off point for the moon and um for mars excellent watch this space basically yeah does it say how long they plan this is going to take to build they haven't really given any time scale on it so they're looking any time between 2020 and 2025 to try and get it done they want to get it done in five years but i can't see them doing that considering how long it took the iss to get going yeah that is true and it's not really been operational that long before they're going to start calling it quits. No, uh, was it? It's, it only got completed about three years ago, didn't it? Something like that? Yeah, yeah. And I think they're going to gradually start, you know, calling it a decommissioning. Uh, is it 2014? Or something like that? 2014, 2018? Mm, possibly. It'll probably be nearer 2018 if they uh, they want to do it for 2020. Um, I can see them extending it, though, personally, because um, I don't know how secure this document is. It's, as I say, it's only leaked. It's... It's not um, signed, sealed, and delivered. Crichton, what are you doing, man? Oh, sir, I'm listening to the Garbage Pod. It's a podcast I found in the podosphere. Right. Uh, do you have anything there, John? Um, yeah, I'm just having a quick look at a moment about um, 
not sure how recent this is, but uh, all about SpaceX. Oh, yeah. Uh, cargo laden SpaceX capsule ends historic resupply mission. Yeah, that was. Uh, when did that happen? October 29th. It's got here. It had been up there for something like two weeks, I think, the best part of two weeks, as part of a um, contract that SpaceX have got with NASA and uh, the European Space Ag uh, Agency to uh, resupply, basically. Uh, they've, they've got the contract for 11 more flights, mm -hmm. and in the meantime, they are experimenting with a landing system, because at the moment, the Dragon capsule splashes down in the Pacific Ocean, uh, what they want to try and do is get it to land back at wherever they're going to launch them from because at the moment it's at the um, it's Cape Canaveral, it's not Kennedy but they are building a purpose uh, launch area in Vandenberg Air Base in California for SpaceX missions because their headquarters is actually based in Hawthorne in, in California in, in um, I think uh, South California so it would make it easier for them. Uh, a lot of these new industries, these new, uh, what they call new space, <laughs> are all based in the California area. So the plan is to get it to land on dry land? Yes. Blimey. Re they can actually pinpoint where they want it to drop? Um, yeah, they will be able to do that. Uh, this, this thing, I can't remember what they called it. Something, I think they called it grasshopper. Um, basically the, the legs actually come down and they can manoeuvre it with a, a motor that's on board and um, land it exactly where they want to land it. Blimey. This is really groundbreaking stuff. If they can pull it off, it'll be a first. Mm. And if they can pull it off, they might even be heading to do it the other way as well. Because I know Elon Musk wants desperately to go either to the moon or Mars. He wants SpaceX to be part of that. Excellent. The next big one for SpaceX is the uh, the Falcon Heavy. At the moment, you're using the Falcon 9, which uh, the the nine represents the nine Merlin engines that are actually fitted to it. All their vehicles will be using the Merlin engines. The Falcon Heavy will have 20, I think it's either 23 or 24 of them. Blimey, that's ridiculous. And it's going to be probably about the size of a uh, Saturn V. It's going to be a big beastie. That is. Was it SpaceX that was going to be considering doing a ramp going to be literally going up a mountain? No. Um, I know the one you mean, and I can't remember who did that now. Um, they showed it on um, spacevidcast.com. Um, yeah, that must have been where I saw it. And it was quite, a, a, quite an interesting one. They also wanted to do the lift as well, uh, a solar lift. That's it, yes. Which I can't see that one working personally, but planetary tether. Yeah, interesting. It's quite quite a, a weird concept, but there are so many companies out there that want to get involved, especially for crew-based missions. You've got Sierra Nevada want to get involved in that. That's the one who's come up with that Dream Chaser, which is a, a little bit like a space shuttle. How can I d describe a Dream Chaser to you? Imagine a space shuttle that's been designed by Disney. That's what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, good on Disney again. <laughs> it, it looks like it's cartoony, a little bit. It's got a, a funny nose that looks like it could be on a, a dog or something. It's 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 strange. You'd, you'd, you'd have to look it up. But um, if you if you look up Dr Dream Chaser, um, you'll see what I mean. It's it's very cartoony. Um, and can carry up to seven people on yep. a low Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. Now, they're going to put it... Uh, let me get this right. Are they going to be sticking it on a Delta rocket, I think? The same that you can yep. do with a... Um, with You know, the Orion mm. capsule? That can also be fitted to a Delta rocket as well. They've made it so that if NASA provides the, the actual firepower, we'll do the rest. So it's, it's another way for NASA to save money, really, which is not a bad thing. It doesn't look hugely different to a standard shuttle. It's a lot, a lot smaller. Matterbomb. A lot smaller. Basically, all it will do is hold crew. The worst thing that they did, uh, and a lot of people agree with me on this, was having a ship that can do crew and cargo. It causes a lot of problems. Stick to one thing. So have two different ships. You want cargo to go up there, send it in a cargo vessel. So when you start mixing crew and cargo together, it's um, a, lo a logistical nightmare. 
<laughs> yeah, I guess it would make sense to have sort of specialised equipment, you know, dedicated for that job instead of a mishmash of trying to make it suit different purposes. Yeah, that that is where uh, the shuttle became a white elephant a little bit. It was great when it first launched. I mean, the first, what, four missions were all test missions, really. And then after that, they started sending up satellites and, and whatnot. And then after Challenger, none of the commu- commercial people wanted anything to do with it. So it was like, well, what do we do with the, with the shuttle now? It's, um, it's a bit of a difficult one. I think originally they only brought out the, the ISS for an idea to give the shuttle something to do, where otherwise it was a, you know, a huge waste of money. Has anything come out of all of the experiments they've done, though? Loads. Absolutely loads. A lot of the, the medical uh, advances that they've made of all, all down the stuff they've done in space, mainly because when you're in space, everything accelerates a lot quicker, so you get your results faster than you would do on Earth. Mm, interesting. So there's a lot of people saying, "Oh, what what have we done since we've been up there?" There are documents. I mean, I I've got one uh, on my hard drive. It's 500 odd pages of things that have actually come out of the. Um, International Space Station since I've been up there. It, it'll blow your mind the sort of stuff from things that you probably would expect, uh, technology kind of stuff, down to things like tennis rackets to make them stronger. It is, it's developed through, you know, like graphite technology. Mm-hmm. Make it lighter, make it stronger. That's what you need when you're in space because weight costs a lot of money. <laughs> when you're trying to get stuff in space. Laura LaRue here. Whenever I'm in the potosphere, there's only one place to be. The garbage pod. Um, right, what else have I got here? The, the California Science Center has opened a temporary exhibition to house the Space Shuttle Endeavour whilst its permanent home is being built. The Endeavour will be on display at the Samuel, and you'll have to forgive me here because I don't know how to pronounce this, Oshchin Space Shuttle Endeavour Display Pavilion, which opened uh, October the 30th. Guests who come to see the Endeavour will begin their experience in Endeavour the California Story. Endeavour the California Story celebrates Endeavour's many scientific achievements and its strong connection to California where all the shuttles were built. The California story includes images and videos of Endeavour under construction locally in Palmdale and Downey, as well as artefacts that flew into space aboard Endeavour. Eventually, when Endeavour's permanent home is completed, she will be lifted vertically and attached to solid rocket boosters and a fuel tank in an exhibition made to replicate what she would have looked like on launch. Sounds interesting. Also, a grand opening of the Atlantis new home at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex is planned for July 2013. The 65,000 square foot exhibit will feature Atlantis as uh, a memorial to the Space Shuttle program. Inside the six-story tall facility, Atlantis will be on display as if she is in orbit performing space missions. With the payload bay doors open, the spectators can get an idea of how much room there was inside the shuttle. The orbiter will be held in place by special support struts so visitors can actually walk round the orbiter and see the complete exterior of the vehicle. The exhibit will tell the story of the space shuttle program and many of its accomplishments like the Hubble Space Telescope and the International Space Station, a permanent home for humans in space that would not be there without the space shuttle's fleet. In addition to that, Several interactive activities and simulators will be part of the new exhibit, giving visitors the opportunity to grapple a satellite with a shuttle's robotic arm and crawl through a model of the International Space Station. Wow. That sounds brilliant. So all of the three remaining shuttles are all being displayed in different ways. The Discovery is at the Smithsonian in Washington, and that is just being displayed as it would be in an um, air museum, like the Imperial War Museum does, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Obviously, now you've got the California exhibition, which, as I said, it's going to be vertical, so it's like it's on launch, and the one at Florida is going to be as though she's flying in orbit. So all, all of them are going to be absolutely brilliant. Uh, the other two shuttles, I shouldn't say shuttles to be honest, you've got the Enterprise which was the first shuttle, it wasn't actually launched, it was um, dropped from a plane and to see if it could land 
like a plane, mm -hmm. uh, but it was the first shuttle. It could actually fly like a shuttle. You could launch it, but it never actually was launched as a shuttle. That is now at the Intrepid Air and Science Museum in New York, uh, which is a really, really strange um, museum because it's actually on board an aircraft carrier. They've actually got one of the Concords on the, um, the flight deck of this um, aircraft carrier. That shows you how big it is. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that must be huge. <laughs> weird a museum on the sea yeah well it's actually on the hudson river but <laughs> weird um and now they've got a space shuttle um, and the other one is not a real shuttle it's a mock-up of uh, one of the orbiters called explorer which used to be at um florida but now florida have got the uh, atlantis it's now moved to houston and they all arrived in different ways I don't know if you've actually seen on the news the um, Endeavour arriving into Los Angeles. Um, yeah, I think so, and it's having to cut a bunch of trees down. And Yeah, it's the, it's the first one to actually use the road system. <laughs> That's chaos, that looks, but... It was fun. It looked fun. Yeah. The Explorer went by boat, which was quite funny because there's a picture of somebody sunbathing on a beach and they looked up and there's this um, space shuttle floating past. Excellent. And the the other two um, flew, but they were the first two to actually go nose to nose with each other, actually met each other. That no other space shuttles have done that before. Oh. You're listening to the garbage pod. Where your input is our output. Do you know what future NASA has? I mean, I know they cut all of their stuff because of funding. Well, NASA is still operating as much as it was before. Not launching anything, are they? At, at the moment, they're not. Do you think they would be when funding comes back? Yes, they've, they, they're, they're actually in production at the moment. It's a replacement for the Ares project. Uh -huh. The rocket part that they're actually creating, well, the Orion can go on the top of it and so can any of the others. So it's, it's pretty universal. So if they do have a pro problem with the Orion or whatever, they don't have to, to scrap it for, you know, until they can find out what's wrong with it, they can go and stick Dream Chaser on the top or whoever else wants to um, put one of those on it. I mean, SpaceX can put um, Dragon on the top if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. Well, that's brilliant. Yeah, they are They are still going. A lot of people think um, who, who are not in the know think that NASA is dead wood now. But it's, it's not. It's far from it. There is a lot going on behind the scenes at NASA at the moment. Excellent. I suppose the same goes with JPL. Yeah, the Jet Propulsion Labs, obviously, they um, are renting themselves out pretty much. I mean, a lot of these new boys that are coming into uh, on the scene, as I say, Sierra Nevada is one of them, they're going to need places to test their stuff. So why have your own stuff when you can rent the place out for a few weeks? Yeah. They've got all the staff on board that can do all the testing and everything for you. Why not? make some money out of other people's work absolutely well, that makes sense so yes they have made a lot of cutbacks at nasa but they want to streamline but this uh, new uh, launching system that they they're developing at the moment this is the thing they want to take to mars that that is it down the line at the end of the day it's mars or nothing that's what it sounds like at the moment excellent apart from china who seems to want to go back to the moon and they, they've been doing so, things so very quickly at the moment. I personally completely agree with something you said last time, which was um, basically use the moon as a refuelling depot. I think that would be a brilliant idea. And go from there. It just seems too much of a stupid idea to miss, if, if you know what I mean. It's, it, it's, it's there, we can use it. I mean, the people are talking about mining on it and this, that, and the other. I'm like, well, what do you want to mine on it for? If you mine on it, you're going to make it smaller. You make it smaller, it's going to change everything here because all our tides and everything are tied in with the moon and things like that. If you start mucking around with how it is, it's going to start mucking around with our natural uh, reactions on this planet. Yeah, it will change the nature of everything here. Yeah. That, that's why I think it's a bad idea. If they want to start mining on things, near-Earth asteroids and stuff. Yes, they're also looking at mining, aren't they? 
Yeah, uh, I've mentioned it on one of the shows before. There's, um, I'm going to have to look at it now because I've forgotten the name of, of it. And uh, there's a problem with that because as soon as I go onto the Garbage Pod website, you know what happens as soon as you go on there. I do. This is the Garbage Pod, <laughs> where your input is our output. Oh, that struggled. <laughs> This is a good advertisement for us, actually. If you go to episode 8 of the Garbage Pod, it's called Out of This World, and we mentioned uh, about the mining of asteroids on there, and there's a company actually involved in that called Planetary Resources, who are um, partly funded by James Cameron. Ah, yes. Because he's into that in a big way. He likes his space, and he likes his... Um, he's a bit of a Jacques Cousteau. He, um, he likes exploring the depth of the, the seabeds as well. Um, there are yeah. companies out there trying Isn't to... Isn't that what gave him the idea for doing um, Sequest, DSV? Possible, and also the Abyss. Ah, yes. <laughs> I won't mention Titanic, because that's not exactly the, <laughs> the right thing, is it? <laughs> The Garbage Pod. Your input is our output. Mark Shelley. What's on the Garbage Pod today? Well, that's the end of the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Let us know what you thought. I always appreciate any uh, feedback that we get from you. Send an email to garbagepod at virginmedia.com. That would be brilliant if you could. Also, please take some time to go to the website. You'll find all the latest news from the Garbage Pod. There's the blog, there's a video page, there's a biog about us, there's all kinds of stuff. And you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter there. Uh, you can subscribe to our RSS feed, and you can also subscribe to the Garbage Pod on iTunes there um, as well. You can find us at www.thegarbagepod, all one word, dot weebly dot com. I'll put up links to everything that was mentioned on this episode of the Garbage Pod. Feel free to have a look. Um, they'll be on the show's page, and there'll be all manner of bits and pieces that you can go and have a look at there. Once again, I'd like to thank John Witz for appearing in this episode of The Garbage Pod. So that only leaves me to say, take care one and all, and I'll speak to you again soon. The Eagle has landed. Roger, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. The Garbage Pod is a Spamhead production.